Hello, and welcome to Lecture 11 for the graduate course ECE 254B, Parallel Processing. Uh, this lecture covers Chapter 10 in the textbook, uh, entitled Routing on a 2D Mesh or Torus. I pronounce this word routing. Uh, others uh, may use routing. Uh, they're the same thing. I prefer the pronunciation routing, uh, but if you hear routing, it's the same thing. So routing is non-existent in the shared memory PIRA model because uh, we basically communicate between processors through the shared memory. And also it's non-existent in the circuit model because all the connections are pre-established. So I'll talk about this in a minute uh, in more detail. So this is now the first time that we are faced uh, explicitly with this problem of routing, sending messages from one processor to another processor, possibly using intermediate processors uh, when the two processors are not directly connected in the architecture that we are dealing with. Okay. So we have various categories of data routing operations. Um, the simplest one and the most commonly used one is point-to-point -point communication. Messages are sent from one source to one destination. So each message has a source and a destination. Of course, multiple messages can coexist, having different sources and different destinations. But each message has one source and one destination. And then we have three categories of what we call collective communication. This is when more than one source or more than one destination or both are involved. So one to many communication is called multicast. So when one processor sends a message to multiple processors, that's called multicast. And if it sends a message to all the processors, that is called broadcast. So broadcast is a special case of one to many communication. It's actually one to all communication. Uh, okay, scatter is when uh, basically uh, a processor sends messages to multiple processors, and multiple processors will be doing this at once. That's called scatter. They scatter information through the network. Then many to one communication, that's multiple sources, one destination. This is sometimes called combine or fan in computation. And then in the special case where the many is actually all processors, so all the processors send information to one processor, uh, that is called global combine. So information from all the processors in the case of global combine or a subset of processors in the case of regular combine uh, are sent to a particular processor that gathers this information and does something with it. Okay, This is also called gather. It, one processor gathers information from other processors. Then the last category of collective communication is many-to-many -many communication, where there are multiple sources and multiple destinations. In a special case where both of those many terms that you see there are is all, are all, we have all-to-all -all broadcast, uh, sometimes called gossiping. So gossiping was every processor is sending a message to every other processor. Like, you know, a bunch of people gossiping among themselves. 
uh, also called scatter gather because information is being scattered by the sources and is being gathered by the destinations. Okay, so we have four categories, point to point, one too many, special case being broadcast, one to all, many to one, combined, special case being global combined, and many to many, the special cases all to all broadcast, also called gossiping. For the most part, today we'll be talking about the first kind of uh, communication, point-to-point -point communication. Now, what do we mean by communication? Well, in a communication um, operation, a message is sent. A message is basically a collection of bits, a record, that needs to be sent from one processor to another processor, in the case of point-to-point or to all processors in the case of broadcast, okay? A message is typically divided into fixed size uh, packets uh, because messages tend to have different lengths, whereas it's possible to design hardware to handle variable length messages, it's easier to deal with fixed length packets. So any message uh, is divided into these packets, first packet, second packet, third, and often the last one, unless the length of the message is divisible by the length of the packet, the last one will be partially filled and uh, some padding is included at the end to basically make this also this packet of the same length as the other ones. Okay, so what is a packet? A packet basically is some data, which is part of the message that we are trying to send. But it also has control information in the form of a header and a trailer. What goes in the header and trailer varies according to the communication protocol. But at the very least, the header tends to contain address information where this packet is headed the address of the destination. And the trailer, at the very least, includes error control information. So information is coded, and the redundant bits for that code are part of the trailer. So at the very least, we have address information in the header and error control information in the trailer. But there may be, depending on the protocol, uh, other pieces of information in those two areas. Of course, it's to our benefit to keep the header and the trailer as short as we can, because those are overheads, okay? We have to transmit this longer packet to send this much data, the green part, okay? So it's to our benefit to minimize the overhead. This is also, the padding is also overhead, and we don't like to have too much of that. So if the packets are smaller, then the padding tends to be smaller. Uh, so there's a trade-off to be made. Okay, now sometimes the packet that is being sent is not sent in one as, as one piece of information, but it's divided into small pieces called flow control digits or flits. So for some communication protocols, the packet is not really the smallest unit that we deal with, but these flits are. A flit is typically anywhere from one byte to maybe eight bytes. Uh, depends on the design, but it, it's a fairly small piece of information for reasons that we will see near the end of the lecture. Okay, so we don't always do this. We don't always divide the packet into flits. Some communication protocols that we'll study require this subdivision. Okay, now types of data routing algorithm, we can divide there are two dichotomies or binary divisions. One is oblivious versus adaptive routing. 
And the second one is optimal versus non-optimal routine. Let me uh, describe what these mean. In oblivious routing, the source destination pair for a packet leads to a unique path. If I tell you what the source of the packet is and what the destination of the packet is, then the path between them is uniquely determined. Okay, even though there may be multiple paths, but the algorithm restricts the message, the transmission of the message to a unique, to a single path. This is, of course, non fault tolerant and it's not flexible. So if that path has some failed element along it, whether nodes are, have failed or links have failed, then that path becomes unavailable and therefore because we are forced to choose that unique path, the message cannot be sent. In adaptive routing, one of the available paths between the source and destination is chosen dynamically based on some criteria that we'll discuss later. Now, for, with such an algorithm, we can avoid faulty nodes and links. Therefore, the algorithm can be, the routing algorithm can be fault tolerant or we can route around, around congested areas. So if other messages are also being sent and some part of the network is congested because too many messages are uh, going uh, along those paths, we can route around those congested areas. So it's more flexible, it can tolerate fault and it can avoid congested areas in the network, therefore sending messages faster. Okay, the more adaptive an algorithm is, the more difficult the decision process is about how to route a message. So there's a trade-off between the decision simplicity on one hand and the degree of adaptivity of the algorithm. Okay, so we typically don't make the algorithm more adaptive than we absolutely need to in order to keep the decision, the routing decisions, as simple as possible. Okay, and optimal routing algorithms uh, choose always choose a shortest path between uh, the source and destination. Okay, so if I want to, uh, these will become clear as we see specific examples later. Uh, so if I have a source and a destination, and there are multiple shortest paths between them, then any of them can be selected by an optimal algorithm. So an optimal algorithm can be oblivious or adaptive. In case there are multiple shortest paths, it can use adaptive decision-making to choose one of those paths. If there's a single shortest path, then of course, you know, then there's no choice. You have to use that in an optimal algorithm. A non-optimal algorithm or non-shortest path algorithm, uh, selection of the shortest path is not guaranteed. Of course, we still prefer to choose the shortest path if possible, but uh, the algorithm is free to choose another path based on you know, various considerations, including, for example, achieving fault tolerance or avoiding congested areas and so on. Okay, so as I mentioned, this is uh, this chapter constitutes a first encounter with data routing issues. As I mentioned before, in shared memory, data routing is not a consideration because any processor can store values in shared memory and any other processor can read those values. And therefore, there's a natural, simple communication mechanism that we can use and it's equally simple to send a piece of data, a message, between processors 0 and 1, between 0 and 2, between 1 and 2 and so on, if this is a uniform memory. If we have non-uniform memory access, which happens in, in the case of distributed shared memory, then of course we have we have issues here as well uh, because where we put any piece of data 
makes it more or less easily accessible to another processor. So data um, layout or data positioning uh, is basically a similar consideration to routing that we uh, consider in this chapter. In circuit model, routing is non-existent because all the connections are fixed. So we say this particular two sorter sends its top output to the top input of this block. This one sends its top output to the lower input of that block. And this is fixed forever. You know, the design of the circuit is fixed forever, so there's no decision about where and how to send data elements between these processing elements or nodes. In a graph model, like the one we are considering today, the mesh, must specify the routing process ex explicitly. Okay, so here's an example of a point-to-point -point, uh, routing problem. This is an example of a static routing problem, meaning that all the packets to be routed are given at the beginning ahead of time, and now we have to decide how to route them. Okay, so A, B, C, D, all the way up to H are packets, and these are their locations. So these are the sources of those packets. These are the destinations of those packets. So packet A, which originates in this processor, must end up in this processor. Its destination basically is this processor. Packet B starts in this processor and must go here. Okay, So this is a static routing problem because all the packets to be routed are given to us at the beginning and we are asked to specify the routes. This is a particular routing algorithm for routing those packets. And this happens to be something that we'll see later in more detail, a row-first algorithm. In other words, packet A wants to go from there to here. We first send it along the row until it is in the correct column, and then along the column until it reaches its destination. So this path represents the path of packet A as it goes from its source to its destination. Packet B needs to go from here to here. Again, using the row first algorithm, we have to route it along the row <clears throat> until it's in the correct column and then down the column to its eventual destination. So these uh, paths with the arrow showing the direction of movement basically say, uh, which paths these packets will take to reach their respective destinations according to the row first routing algorithm. All right, now let's examine these paths in more detail because when there are all these paths being established at the same time, there's a possibility that there are conflicts between them. So, in order to assess whether there are conflicts, these numbers that I put on the path, so I'm assuming a synchronous model of communication, meaning that each of these packets or messages, I'm assuming single packet messages for simplicity. So packet and message are used interchangeably in this discussion. So this packet or message, time zero, it's there. At time one, the next clock cycle is here. At time two is in this processor. At time three, it's here. At time four, it reaches its destination. Packet B at time zero is here. At time one, it's here. Two, three, four, it reaches its destination. Now look at the numbers inside each processor. As long as the numbers are different, there are no conflicts. So for example, this processor has its own packet, at time zero, which it gets rid of and pushes it there. So at time one, that packet is gone and this new packet comes in. And therefore, there's no conflict between these two. 
we assume that each processor can handle one packet at a time, <laughs> then as long as, so here you see number 024, meaning this packet is at this processor at time zero, this one is there at time two, and this one is there at time four, again, no conflict. The only case of conflict in this particular example is here. There are two packets that reside in this processor at time one. So this packet has come in over this channel from the west, and it's trying to turn right to go on this channel. And this packet has arrived here, and it has its destination here. So basically stops there. Okay, so depending on assumption whether um, a processor can handle two incoming packets at the same time, then this will be okay. Otherwise, one of these has to be delayed. One of these has to wait. Uh, so maybe I can put, I can start uh, this packet instead of at time zero, at time one. And then it will be here at time two, but then it will conflict with that one. If I started at time two, then it will conflict with this one. Okay, so that that's basically the nature of conflict. You have to try to resolve this conflict in order to honor the restrictions that we have. And how many packets can be in a processor at the same time? Okay, the typical assumption for many of our algorithms is that there should be just one packet in a processor at any given time. Uh, this is, if we can ensure that it's good, because then uh, the processor will be handling one packet at a time. More importantly, you don't need a lot of storage or buffer space in the processor. Multiple packets can reside in the processor uh, and only one of them, say, can leave uh, on its way to its destination, then the rest of the packet should be stored. And this requires storage space and therefore more complexity for the routers within each processor because they have to store packets. By the way, this scheme that I just discussed here is called the store and forward model of routing because a packet is stored here and then it's forwarded to here. Then it's stored here. So the, these are basically the steps uh, shown with color coding. So packet A is here. Then in the next clock cycle, it moves here. So it's shown, it's stored in this processor for that one clock cycle. Then in the next clock cycle, it moves one step closer to its destination. In the next one, it moves here. And here it gets to its destination after four cycles. One, two, three, four. And for this particular alg alg uh, problem instance, a four is the maximum. So these two packets get to their destination at time four. So the, the double circles indicate that the packet has arrived at its destination. Okay, these two packets, D and G, take three steps to get to their destinations. Uh, e, F, and H take just two steps. And C gets to its destination in one step because it's going from here to here. It's just going one step up. And the conflict that I mentioned is noticeable here. Because C and B get to this processor at the same time. And that we may have to avoid if the processor can accept only one packet, can handle only one packet at any given time. Okay, here are some special routing operations that uh, we have given name to. Uh, because there, there are important special cases of routing. Uh, data compaction basically is when you have some scattered set of packets throughout the mesh, 
and you sort of compact them, push them into a smaller mesh so that they are less dispersed. But this happens, for example, if you're doing something like a recursive algorithm where you start with 16 candidates or 16 elements and then you remove eight of them, let's say the blank processors uh, no longer have relevant data and only these eight processors have relevant data to be processed. Okay, if we keep these eight items where they are, distances between them will be larger than needed. So communication will be slow. However, if we invest some time packing these elements into a smaller submesh, then they become closer to each other and communication between them will be more efficient. So we pay a one-time overhead of packing these into a submesh. Packing means basically putting them as close to each other as possible. And then for the rest of the uh, process, we'll be dealing with the smaller mesh distances are smaller. So that's called data compaction or packing. Uh, another operation we call random access write. This is basically a point-to-point -point communication problem. And we call it random access write because it's sort of an emulation of the write step in PRAM. In PRAM, so imagine that uh, our PRAM has 16 processors and 16 memory locations. And this processor wants to write into this memory location. This processor wants to write into this memory location. This is the same problem I showed you in the previous slide. Now I'm giving it a different interpretation. <clears throat> so I'm viewing now this writing problem as processors writing into memory locations or memory banks, if you will. Okay. So this processor tries to write into this bank, this processor tries to write into this bank, and so on. Okay, so if each packet comes from a different processor, which is the case for PRAM, each processor writes one item, and if destinations are also distinct, this corresponds to ER exclusive read exclusive write. PRAM. Uh, however, if say these two A and B are headed both for this, then that will be concurrent write, okay? Because two processors are trying to write into the same location. But we usually uh, prefer to use EREW, so that's basically a point to point communication problem. And then random access read, which is another operation that PRAM performs, can be emulated by two writes. So, for example, if this processor tries to read something from this memory location, we do this in two steps. First, this processor writes something here, basically notifying that memory location that is asking for data from that location. And then this one writes back. It knows that which processor made this request. So two random access writes can be used to emulate a random access read. The reading basically will be slower because it, reads, it requires two random access writes. Okay, some useful elementary operations that we need as building blocks to develop mesh algorithms. A row column rotation basically is an all-to-all -all broadcasting operation in a row or column. Um, I haven't drawn a diagram here, so let's use this diagram, which is actually for the semi-group computation. This is when we want all the processors in a row of the mesh to be informed about all the other values that are in that row. Okay, so for that we do an all-to-all -all broadcasting uh, through basically rotation. 
So we move data uh, to the right so that every processor will see the values coming from the left. And then we move data to the left so that every processor will see the values that are to its right. If this is a torus, <clears throat> then this operation is simplified. We simply shift to the right with this end around connection. And after a square, if this is a square root of p by square root of p mesh, after square root of p rotation steps, every processor will have seen all the values of the other processor. <clears throat> we also need sorting as a building block. We have already discussed sorting in chapter 9, so we won't say anything more. Whenever we need sorting, we know that we have algorithms that we can use. <clears throat> then semi-group computation. Semi-group is basically when we want to combine all the elements in the mesh. Let's say add. Uh, each processor has a number, and we want to add values. OK, so basically, we can use a recursive algorithm. First, do semi-group computation in quadrants. Once we have done that, if we are doing addition, let's take the addition, which is simple. Uh, we have the sum of values in this submesh. And every processor in the submesh knows the sum for the submesh. Every processor in this submesh knows the sum for that submesh, and so on. And we take this value, which is the sum. So this processor knows the sum for its submesh, and broadcast it to the right, so broadcast it half the way, half the width of the mesh, so that all the processors on this row get to see that value and can add it to their own values, and similarly for other rows. So now, at the top part, I have row sums, basically, because uh, I have, um, sorry, I have uh, the sum of this half of the mesh, because I took the sum of this quadrant and added it to the sum of this quadrant, which every processor possessed. So I have now the sum of all of the element in this half. And then I do the same thing along the columns. I take the sum for the upper half and broadcast it so that every processor in the lower half of this column adds that value to its value, and then I have the sum. Okay, so in terms of running time, uh, the, you can write the recurrence here. Tf square root of p is equal to Tf square root of p over 2 plus square root of p over 2 plus, so that, that's the broadcast time the distance that this value has to travel, plus square root of p over 2. OK, I'll leave it up to you to solve that recurrence and establish that this is an optimal algorithm. Now, for parallel prefix computation, the algorithm is a little bit more complicated. So we do, again, recursively, find the prefix sum values in each quadrant. So this is basically the direction of the prefix sums. So this is basically the first element. This is the sum of the first two. And this is the sum of all the elements in this quadrant. Okay. Similarly, for this one, we do in reverse order for reasons that you will see in a minute. So here I have the sum of a quadrant. And here I have the sum of this, this quadrant. Those two values are broadcast into these quadrants, this value into this quadrant, and this value into this quadrant. OK, so because the sum of all these values is added to the prefixes I already computed for this quadrant, then basically I now have prefix sums for this half. And I also have prefix sums for this half. Then the rest is basically to 
complete the, the row computation. So take, for example, this sum of this half row and send it to the right here. Each one basically adds that value to its own and passes on that value. Uh, okay, so again, I leave it up to you to write the uh, recurrence and solve it to see how much time this takes. So I do the two combining phases here, combining of these two special values into these quadrants, and then combining across the rows. Okay, so let's talk about routing on a linear array in preparation, because a linear array is basically a mesh row or a mesh column. Once we know how to root on a linear array, then we can use that knowledge, that information, to root in a mesh. Okay, so here I've shown a linear array with six processors, numbered 0 through 5. And these are packets. Each packet has an information, D, which is really irrelevant as far as routing is concerned, and a destination address. So this packet is headed to processor 2, so it must go, must get there through processor 1. Okay, this one is headed for processor 5. So in this case, you know, decision about routing is trivial. A packet either goes to the right or goes to the left. And whether it goes to the right or to the left is determined by the address. So if the destination address is larger than the processor address, 5 is larger than 1, the packet needs to go to the right. If it's smaller, as in the case here, destination is 0, processor number is 2, it has to go to the left. There's no other choice. OK, so in order to route these packets, we convert the destination address into a relative address. So a packet going from processor 0 from processor 0 to processor 2, keep losing my pointer, okay. From 0 to 2, it has to move plus two steps, two steps in the right direction. A packet that needs to go from processor 1 to 5 needs to go plus four steps. This one from 2 to 0, minus two steps, and so on. Those that have negative, num negative distance are left-moving packets. Those that have positive distance are right-moving packets. And if these channels between processors are bidirectional, right-moving packets and left-moving packets do not interfere with each other because this line can accommodate a packet going from 2 to 3, and another packet going from 3 to 2, if this is bidirectional. If it's not bidirectional, if it can handle only a message in one direction or the other at the time, then we alternate between these two. Okay, so, and then right moving packets among themselves do not interfere with each other because they're all moving in the same direction. Okay, so they're basically moving together in the same direction. They never catch up with each other or interfere. Similarly, left moving packets never interfere with each other. Okay, so if the communication link between two processors is bidirectional, there is no conflict whatsoever. And everything moves towards its destination at the fastest possible speed. Of course, we still have, if this is a long linear array, it takes a long time for all the left moving packets and all the right moving packets to get to where they need to go. If these are unidirectional uh, channels, they can handle message in one or the other direction, then we alternate. So, for example, in one clock cycle, we say, okay, every left moving packet move one step towards its destination. So this one will go here, this one will go here. 
In the next clock cycle, we say every right moving packet. So this one will move here, this one will move here. So it will take twice as many clock cycles to finish the routing. And then you can follow this example. Uh, these boxes show when the uh, message has arrived at its destination. So for example, message E wanted to go from here to here. So it just takes one, one routing step to get there. Okay, whereas C, which wants to go from here to one, it has to move four steps. Okay, so here I've shown the case where right and left moving pat packets alternate. So in one clock side cycle, we allow the right moving packets to move, then the left moving, then the right, then the left. Okay, so these two will be just one cycle in the case of bidirectional methods. Okay, on the 2D array, here is one way to do routing. Remember that if we are not careful, uh, packets can conflict with each other in terms of the links and processors that they want to use. And therefore, in order to avoid those conflicts, we devise this algorithm. Okay, sort packets in column major order by destination column number. Break ties by destination row number. Okay, so here's the beginning. And there's a packet here that wants to go. So this is the destination address in terms of row and column number. So this packet wants to go to row zero, column two. In other words, it wants to go there. This packet wants to go to row two, column three. In other words, it wants to go here. Row two, sorry, here. Row two, column three. Okay, so each packet shown, uh, we show where it is right now at the beginning. And then what it wants to go is this pair of numbers that you see inside the box. Okay, so sort the packets. So the algorithm says sort the packets in column major order by destination column number. So this one destination column is two. This one is zero. This one is zero. After I sort in column major order, all the packets that have their destination column equal to zero come here. All the packets whose destination column number is 1. Then all the packets whose destination column is 2. Then all the packets whose destination column is 3. Okay, we'll see in a minute why this sorting uh, is helpful. All right. Now, in the second phase, shift packets to the right so that each item is in the correct column. So at this point, these are already in the correct column, column zero, okay? This one is not in the correct column, so shift it to the right. This one also is not in the correct column, shift it to the right, okay? This one is not in the correct column, shift it to the right. This one is not. The... So basically, any movement that exists in this phase will be from left to right, and therefore there are no conflicts between them. All the packets are moving in the same direction if they have to move. Some of them don't have to move, like this one, for example, it's already in the correct place. Okay. Okay. Then now each packet is in the correct column. So these are all the packets whose destinations are in column zero column one, column two, column three, we just do column routing, which is basically a linear array routing that we discussed in the previous slide, and therefore we know how to do that. And again, there is no conflict, okay? And then basically we are done. Now notice this packet that was here initially. After sorting, it moved up here. 
After row routing, it didn't move, it stayed there. And after column routing, it moved from up there to down here. Notice that this packet needed to move just short distance. It could have gone this way to get to its destination, but instead it went there. I don't know because it depends on the sorting algorithm used, what path it took to get there. We don't know. Um, and uh, so we see that the path is much longer than the shortest path. The shortest path is a flank two from here to here, whereas this one took many steps during sorting to get there, zero step there, then three steps in this column phase. Okay, so this isn't the shortest path or an optimal routing algorithm. The nice thing about it is that it has no conflicts. Once we sort, then the rest of the process, and sorting, of course, the algorithms we use do not have any conflicts because we've already developed the algorithms. Okay, so let's analyze this algorithm. So here we see the path of that packet 31. It started here. It took some path, we don't know what path, to get down there, to get up there. And then it took this path to get down here. And this is definitely not a shortest path. OK, so the time complexity of this algorithm is we use a sorting algorithm. So here we assume we use the optimal sorting algorithm of Schnorr and Shamir is 3 squared of p plus lower order terms. And then because Schnorr and Shamir algorithm is a, a snake-like order, we have to reverse every other column in order to make it into column major. Remember that the algorithm says sort into column major order. All right? <clears throat> so this is Schnorr and Shamir sorting algorithm. This is reversal of every other column to complete the column major sorting order. Then we need uh, row sort, uh, row routing, and then column routing. And that, in the worst case, would require basically something to go from this corner to this corner. And that's 2 square root of p minus 2. So the running time of this algorithm is roughly 6 square root of p. So it's non-optimal in two senses. It doesn't choose the shortest path. And also, it doesn't take the minimal time. But we would hope that we can do the routing in 2 square root of p time, which is the diameter of the mesh. We are using 6 square root of p time. Now, if communication is unidirectional between these, then this will require 11 square root of p. Basically, we have to double this, because in sorting, we compare exchange. So it's a bidirectional transfer. We have to double the time for that. And then we have to double one of these. Remember that in row routing, all the movements are in one direction. So that square root of p that is for row routing does not need to be doubled. That's why we have 11 square root of p. This algorithm minimizes the buffer space requirement in each processor because at any given time, each processor contains just one item. That's true during sorting. We developed our sorting algorithm so that one one uh, item is stored in each processor at any given time. And then during the row movement and column movement, that property of an item per processor is maintained. So it minimizes the buffer space. OK, now let's take what we call a greedy routing algorithm. Now, greedy algorithms in computer science are often non-optimal. 
However, in some cases, there are problems for which greedy, optimal greedy algorithms exist. So here is the greedy algorithm for routing. Again, I start with the same configuration. So not the same, sorry, but a configuration of packets and each packet has a destination. So this one is headed to row two, column one, which is here and so on. So we just don't care. We just send each packet towards its destination using a row first routing algorithm. So this one is headed to here. We send it there in the first step. Then we send it down in subsequent steps. So in the next step, it goes there. In the next step after that, it goes there. Similarly for all the other packets. This is 0, 0. So it moves there in the first step. And it moves there in the second step. Notice that there are processors that have multiple packets at some time step. So this, this one basically sent each packet towards its destination with every step. So it's greedy in that sense. It doesn't make packets wait. It just tries to send it. It assumes that processors have enough storage space to accommodate all the packets that end up uh, in that particular processor at any given time. Now, of course, if packets want to move in the same uh, direction, okay, so these two packets, for example, both want to go to column one. This one wants to go to this processor, one, one. This one wants to go to this processor. This one has to make a decision as to which one to send out first. Okay, and the appropriate decision that minimizes the latency of the routing algorithm is to send the packet that has to go a longer distance first. Okay, so this one needs to go two steps. This one needs to go one step. If you send that one first, and then this one in the next cycle, both of those will get to the destination at the same time, therefore minimizing the latency. Whereas if you send this one first, then that one needs two additional steps, so the routing uh, process is completed later. Now, assuming that nodes have enough buffer space to accommodate all the packets that end up there, then this algorithm is optimal. It takes two square root of p minus two steps to root, provided that we use that decision uh, process that I outlined. If, if multiple packets here too, we have two packets, one of them is already as its destination, so this one will be sent out. Whenever you have two packets uh, and they have to move within the column, uh, then uh, you send one that has to go uh, furthest distance first. Okay? Now let's see what happens with this algorithm in the worst case. So packets accumulate in a node such as this one because packets will be coming from the left. So suppose these are all packets that are headed into the same column, okay? So these arrows show the paths for those. So this one comes from here, this one comes from here, and so on. So they all converge into this node. Of course, because these arrive at different times, they don't conflict necessarily with each other. But at the same time, from the other direction, packets are coming. So for example, this packet and this packet arrive here at the same time, okay? So we have two packets. One of them can be sent and the other one must be kept. Then in the next cycle, two more packets come in. We already had one packet left over from the previous cycle. So we now have three packets and one of them can be sent and two must be kept, okay? So basically, it's easy to show that you need 
order square root of p buffer space here because in the worst case all of these packets coming here need to go we are lucky some of these need to go words and therefore do not come conflict with it, each other but in the worst case in fact the situation is worse than this because packets can be coming from up here so actually in each clock cycle three packets can enter this node one from left one from right one from above that you know the one from above may have originated from right or left or from further up the column so the worst case is when three packets come in on every clock cycles and one packet can leave, so two packets accumulate per clock cycle. The total number of packets that are headed for this column J is at most square root of P. If we are doing one one routing, there won't be more than square root of P packets that need to go to this column. So basically, 2 square root of p over 3 is the maximum size of the buffer in this node. OK, so we have now developed two algorithms. One required 6 square root of p steps, one buffer per node. This one that we just discussed requires 2 square root of p step, but needs large buffers in nodes. And large buffers basically add to the node complexity. Furthermore, it becomes non-trivial. If you have, let's say, uh, 50 packets in buffers waiting to be sent, deciding which one to send next requires some, so some sort of search because you have to look at the addresses and see which one should be sent first in order to guarantee this minimum time. As I mentioned, the one that has to go a longer distance should be sent first. And therefore, the node complexity grows, both because of the large buffer space it requires and because of that decision process to, to pick the packet to be sent next. So is there a middle ground? Can we do something in between these two so that the buffers are not as large? Okay, also the time complexity is not as large as this one. It turns out that we can, and I'll only briefly describe this, leaving you to read uh, the detailed proof, which is given both here and in the textbook. So instead of sorting the entire array, which is basically a major contributor to time complexity, Notice that the sorting part was 4 square root of p, and the rest was 2 square root of p. So in order to reduce that sorting time, we sort packets in small submeshes, not in the entire mesh. So that takes less time. For example, if I take the submeshes to be of size square root of p over q, so in this example I've shown q to be equal to 5. So there are 5 blocks. And this one will be square root of p divided by 5. So it's a smaller array, therefore sorting in it takes less time. Now this sorting basically, so uh, let's take this, this row of blocks, numbered b0, b1, b2, bq minus 1. So they're q blocks. Now each of these blocks may have some packets that are headed for column j. Okay, the number of packets in block 0 I call R0. I don't know how many will be there, okay? Then the number here I call R1, R2, RQ minus 1. The only thing I know is that R1 plus R2 plus R3 and so on, R0 plus R1 plus R2, all of those cannot exceed J because at most J packets can go to this column J. Okay, but the distribution can be arbitrary. When I sort these blocks, those packets that need to go to column J will be basically divided, almost evenly divided between the rows. So therefore, there will be in each row R 
sub k divided by the width of the array, which is square root of p over q. And therefore, this will be the total number of packets that are headed on any given row to column j. So that's basically how many packets end up in that node and want to turn there into the column. Okay, And this expression can be basically I remove ceiling and add 1, which is the worst case that the ceiling adds. And then I simplify this. And notice that it's less than, uh, because there was a less than sign there, this will be less than 2q. In other words, the total number of packets that accumulate in that cell will be less than, strictly less than 2q. Okay? So it's up to me to choose q. Because it will be strictly less than 2q, 2q minus 1 buffers will suffice in each of these nodes. Okay, so q is a constant that is up to me to select. Okay, if I select q equal to 1, then basically I'm not subdividing the mesh into smaller meshes, and therefore. I'll be just sorting the entire mesh. Therefore, q equal to 1, the total time will be 6 square root of p, as in our sorting-based algorithm. At the other extreme, if q is fairly large, then this term, the sorting term, will become small. And I can make it as small as I want by choosing larger and larger q. Then the time complexity approaches that of the greedy algorithm. But then I will need more buffers, okay? Because the size of the buffer grows with Q. So it's up to me to choose Q to sort of strike a balance between uh, speed of the algorithm and its buffer size requirement. Okay, so we talked about row-first greeting routing algorithm, routing algorithm, although it does lead to conflicts, and therefore to guarantee that shortest time, we need large buffers. If we don't have large buffers, statistically speaking, the performance will not be degraded much. Okay, so for example, I said 2 square root of p over 3 should be the number of buffers. Okay, suppose we just provide four buffers. Well, if we have four buffers, then some messages will be late will have to be stopped because there's no room for them. But statistically, this doesn't happen very often. Therefore, the average case performance will be pretty close to 2 square root of p, even the limited number of buffers. Okay, If, if we have a random routing, you can construct worst case scenarios, some routing uh, patterns that lead to high conflict, but on average, for random routing uh, problems, uh, the conflicts are manageable and, and the running time is not very far from the optimal 2 square root of p. So because for random routing, the performance is pretty good, this gives us an idea. If a particular routing problem is not random, and we notice that it leads to a lot of conflicts, we can decompose it into two random routing problems. So any message that wants to go from processor i to processor k can be sent first to a random processor j, again, intermediate randomly chosen processor j, and then from j to k. Okay, So I can decompose any routing problem into two random routing problems and then benefit from the good performance of greedy routing and random routing problems. But of course, I double the running time because there are two, two stages. OK, another idea for improving the performance uh, and avoiding conflicts is combining. So suppose I have 
two right operations coming into here that are both headed there, okay? So these two basically conflict here. They both want to go over this link, and therefore one of them must be delayed. Okay? Now, depending on the semantics of this communication, why am I sending, why, why am I writing these two values? If this one eventually will add these two values and store that sum, then I can combine the two values. So if this is a summation process, instead of sending both of these values towards this destination, I can add them in the intermediate nodes and just send one value over. Okay, so some of these conflicts can be avoided by combining, if in fact combining is possible uh, because of what I will eventually do with the values here. Similarly, these three values have been combined and just one value sent, and this reduces the conflicts and speeds up routing if, if it's possible. Okay, I already mentioned some of these. So we may have uh, static routing uh, problems. That's when all the packets exist at the beginning, they're given to us, and our problem is to find paths for them to go to their destination. Of course, if we have oblivious routing, then routing decision is immaterial because there's just one path that we can choose, and therefore there's no decision involved. Uh, but uh, if we don't have, if we have adaptive routing, then uh, of course decision will be involved. A dynamic routing problem is when packets are born, are generated in the course of computation. So we are running a parallel computation on the mesh, and at one point, the process running on one of the processors decides to send uh, a packet to another processor. That packet is born as a result of the computation, is created. Uh, sometimes we say spawned. They're spawned because of the computation. In which case, we can't do the decisions ahead of time because we don't know where and when these packets will be born. And therefore, we need to have a dynamic routing algorithm that makes decisions on the fly as packets are created. Offline versus online. We have a static problem. We can use an offline algorithm to determine the paths and then store those paths in tables for use whenever needed. On the other hand, if we have a dynamic problem or we may prefer to use an online algorithm, routing decisions are made on the fly in an online algorithm. So basically, a processor trying to send a packet to another processor just decides which neighbor to send it to. It doesn't compute the complete path, or does not have to compute complete the compute the complete path. Sends it to a neighbor based on some criterion, and then that neighbor in turn decides where to send it next. So decisions are made one step at a time in an online manner. Oblivious and adaptive, I already discussed. And then the final idea on this slide is deflection routing, uh, sometimes also called hot potato routing. Uh, in this case, a packet coming into a node must leave that node on the next clock cycle. There is no storage buffer available for messages to stay there. They come in and leave on the next clock cycle. Now, if two packets conflict with each other, then of course we can't send both of them in, uh, towards their destination. Uh, so we deflect or use a detour for one of them. So here I've shown an example. Suppose there's a message, uh, this green pad, coming from this processor and it's headed to this processor. So it comes here and it conflicts, so this one is trying to go to the right, and maybe this one also tries to go to the right. Let's say we make a decision to send this one to so the two conflict, and we deflect the other message, send it in the wrong direction, 
just taking it further away from. Then it makes a turn trying to get back. And then at some point it conflicts with this one. Let's say both of them want to turn in this direction. Let's say depending on our priority scheme, this one is given priority and this one is deflected. Okay, so any message that comes in in one clock cycle must be sent out in the next clock cycle. This is called deflection or hot potato routing. Uh, the attraction of this method is that we don't need any buffers. The drawback is that messages may take a long time to get to the destinations because they're deflected. This is like roads being closed and we have to take detours. And in fact, if we are not careful, the message can be deflected indefinitely and never get to its destination. Okay. Although there are simple algorithms to ensure that that doesn't happen, for example, we can assign to each message an age, a number that is its age, how long the message has been floating around in the network. As the age of a message grows, it assumes higher priority. So if it conflicts with this one and it's a young message, it just started, then it will be deflected. But then later on, when it conflicts with another message, if this one has already been in the network for a long time, it will be given priority and will get to its destination. So this basically avoids the creation of an end, endless path for a message because as, it, as its age grows, it will uh, assume higher priority and therefore it's less likely to be deflected. Okay, the last uh, idea in this chapter is something called wormhole routing or wormhole switching. Okay, so what is wormhole switching? Uh, we talked about packet switching in the previous uh, discussions. That's basically when a whole packet moves from one processor to another processor and then it's stored there and then it makes the next move, the entire packet. In circuit switching, basically, we establish a circuit. Uh, old telephone networks were, were based on circuit switching. So if I picked up my phone um, some 40, 50 years ago uh, and dialed the number of a friend, a circuit would be established between my home and uh, the switching facility of the telephone company. A circuit would be established between that switching facility to a switching facility near my friend's home, and a circuit from that second switching facility to the friend's home. In fact, there may be multiple switches along the way. But this physical circuit would be established before I could start talking, and my voice would be transmitted over this established circuit. So that circuit, which is basically a physical line, would be dedicated completely to this phone conversation. And it would be, its capability would be wasted because uh, uh, a voice conversation requires very low bandwidth and any communication line can carry much higher bandwidth. So basically the way it works in modern telephone switching is that my voice is sampled and uh, packets are formed from the voice sample. And these packets are sent over the network and get to the other side. Sometimes the packets may get there out of order because they may go over different paths. Uh, but because the packets are numbered, uh, they have sequence numbers, then they will be assembled in the correct order. And if the latency of these packets is not significant, then basically my friend hears my voice as normal. Uh, and uh, many, many thousands of packets can go over a single physical line and therefore the communication uh, facility will be used more efficiently. Now, warm horse switching is an intermediate solution between circuit switching and packet switching. Here I've shown 
a message trying to go from C to D and another message going from A to B. So the head of the message I've indicated with the circle to show that this is the direction in which it is moving. That's why I say this packet is going from A to B and not from B to A because the head of the message is not there. Okay? So this message occupies the channels only along this portion of the path so that the channels over here and the channels here are not used. They can be used for other messages. Okay? So the way things work is that the packet will be divided into flits, as I mentioned at the beginning of the lecture, the header flit, and then a bunch of follower flits. The header flit will find its way. So routing is done for the header flit. And then all the other flits just follow it in sequence. No separate decision needs to be made for those. The first flit is the header, then the second flit follows it. One step after that, then the next flit, and so on. So here, for example, this header flit is sitting here. The, there's a processor here, and it makes a decision to send it this way. And when it goes this way, the next flit will follow it, and so on. So all of the flits move sort of like a worm because the, the tail of the worm follows its head wherever it, it goes. Okay, so you see that uh, packets can flow and they usually do not interfere with each other unless, you know, they overlap. One danger of wormhole switching is that we may encounter what is known as deadlock. So here we have a worm it has progress to this point and now it wants to turn right. But turning right is impossible because this worm is using the channels along that path. This one wants to turn right, but it's blocked by this worm and so on. So there's circular waiting. And therefore, none of these worms can make progress towards its destination. We have what is known as deadlock. This is a major problem in wormhole switching. And there are two solutions for it. One is avoiding deadlocks, and the second one is delete, uh, the detecting deadlocks and then dealing. So if I know that this deadlock has occurred, perhaps I can drop one of these worms and then resolve the deadlock. And then that worm that was dropped will be retransmitted later. So if I have an acknowledgement mechanism so that the receiver always acknowledges the receipt of a message and the sender does not receive an acknowledgement after a while, it assumes that the worm was lost and therefore it will retransmit. Okay, so I can detect the deadlock, which isn't an easy thing to do, by the way. If I have a mechanism to detect the deadlock, I can resolve it. And my hope is that this doesn't happen very often so I don't lose a lot of communication capability or bandwidth uh, to deadlock. Okay, so th this is basically the same thing. So here you see that I have two worms, the orange one and the light blue one. This one wants to go from source two to destination two. This one from source one to destination one. And this is where the worm currently is. And this worm cannot make progress because that one has made this turn before and therefore it's occupying those channels. This one, um, there are various ways of dealing with this that will come in the next slide. Okay, so this is how we deal with conflicts among worms. We can buffer. So basically, this worm that came in and cannot make progress can be buffered in this node and wait for some uh, later time to make progress. But this adds to the complexity of each node. And then multiple worms can actually accumulate in one processor requiring a large 
uh, communication, a large buffer space. We can block this. Basically, if we design the worms, the communication protocol, so that each flit in order to move to the next step requires explicit permission from the previous flit, then when this flit encounters a blockage, it doesn't give permission for this one to move, and this one doesn't give permission for this one to move. So basically, the worm freezes in place. It stays in place until the head can make progress, and then it just pulls the rest of the packets with it. Uh, the problem with this is that if you have a lot of worms blocked, then basically those blocked worms in turn can block other worms, so a lot of blockage can be created. Uh, the third solution is to simply dr drop, discard the worm that is blocked. Again, this requires some sort of acknowledgement from the recipient so that this can be retransmitted later on. And then we can use deflection or hot potato routing. This worm wants to go in that direction, cannot make progress. If there is a free channel in that direction. We send it in that direction. So this is sort of attractive because nothing stays in place. We don't need any space, storage space. But on the other hand, worms tend to get longer paths to get to their destinations. Okay, two strategies, avoidance and detection, followed by recovery. Okay, let's talk about avoidance. Um, here I've shown a three by three mesh. And these are the communication channels. I've numbered all the communication channels. Okay, so channel 1, channel 2, channel 3, channel 4. So these are bidirectional links. I've numbered the two sections, the two parts, left to right, uh, right to left, and left to right separately. Okay, from this graph, which is basically the connectivity graph of the mesh, I derive another graph. Okay, which I call dependence graph. Now in this new graph, the nodes correspond to links. So this link three becomes a node in this dependence graph. Link one becomes node one in this new graph. Okay, so there are as many nodes in this graph as there are links in this original graph. Now connection, if I have an unrestricted routing algorithm, basically a message, for example, going over link three, if it's unrestricted, it can go over one next, or it can go over seven next. We don't use four next because a message coming over three, we don't send it over four, okay? That's just going back. Although in deflection routing, that may happen, but let's ignore that case. Okay, as another example, a message coming over link 13 can go next over 8 or 17 or 11. So 13 can go over 8. So the arrows show where it can go next. 13 can go to 8. Uh, these arrows are a little bit unclear. It can go to 17. This is 17. Or it can go to 11. Okay, so this is basically the dependence graph for this architecture with unrestricted routing. Now, whenever this dependence graph has a loop, then I may get in trouble. And here's an example of a loop. 8 to 4, 4 to 9, 9 to 13, 13 to 8. So it's possible for messages to have circular weighting if they are on these links, 4, 8, 9, and 13. 4, 8, 9, and 13. So circular waiting for messages is possible, and therefore there could be deadlock. Okay. Now, if I do row-first routing, this will be the dependence graph. Row-first basically means if a message comes over 3, 
It can go over one, that's basically a continuation of the row path, or it can go over seven, this is basically turning into the column. So that part doesn't change. After three, the message can go to one, or it can go to seven. However, if a message is coming over seven, in the unrestricted routing, it could go over 11, 14, or 17. But if I'm doing row first routing, after seven, it can only go to 17. Because once I start the column routing phase, I can't go back to row, okay, it's row first. Okay, so from seven, the only option is to go to 17. So this is the link dependence graph for uh, row first routing, or sometimes called E cube routing. Okay, row first. And this graph does not have any cycles, and therefore deadlock is impossible. If I do wormhole routing, deadlock is impossible for this graph. Therefore, this is an example of deadlock avoidance. If I use this particular algorithm, I'm avoiding deadlocks. So any time that the link dependence graph does not have a cycle in it, then the scheme is guaranteed to be deadlock free. Okay, so this is a sufficient condition. Not having a cycle is a sufficient condition for the algorithm to be deadlock free. However, it's not necessary. In other words, there can be uh, cycles in the dependence graph without deadlock occurring, depending on the routing algorithm that I use. So here's an example. Now, because circular routing was the source of the problem, if I devise a routing algorithm that this allows one of these turns, in other words, a message going northwards can turn right towards east, a message going eastward can turn right towards south, so three turns are possible. This one is disallowed. A message going southwards, going over a column towards, uh, downwards over a column, it cannot turn in this direction. Okay, so if one of these turns is disallowed in the algorithm, that becomes deadlock free. A second approach for avoiding deadlocks is the use of virtual channels. Basically, if I have a single physical channel between two processors, I can divide it into two virtual channels by simply using half of its capabilities in one cycle and the other half in the other cycle. So basically, on even cycles, I use this virtual channel. So the same physical channel has two, corresponds to two virtual channels. One over the even cycles, even numbered clock cycles, one over the odd numbered clock cycle. So even though now these two messages, they both try to turn here, and normally one of them has to wait for the other one, they can both make progress because one goes over this virtual channel and another one go with, goes over this virtual. So by proper accommodation of virtual channels, provision of virtual channels, we can avoid deadlock. Of course, then the messages will go slower because, say, if you have two virtual channels, every other clock cycles, each message can make progress towards its destination. Okay, that's all I wanted to say about routing on 2D meshes and torus networks. And next time we will cover, next lecture we will cover chapters 11. And 12 with some very which contains some very interesting ideas okay uh, bye for now stay safe see you in the next lecture